If we care, why don't we share? We desperately need a new, more sustainable mindset to reach the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. Everything we create must have a positive ripple effect around the world. And we have to dare to do it together. Governments, businesses and educators. During the Global Goals Jam, creative changemakers from around the world will spend two days to design the best possible solutions to local challenges that relate to the Global Goals. Our impact is global and is not limited to having smart solutions for complex problems. We are a network, a source of innovation power, ready to tackle global challenges from a local perspective. Together, Join us and let's transform the world. Design 2013 now. Hello everyone, and welcome to the official opening of the Global Gold Jam 2020. Well, before I introduce myself, I would like to, like, like to ask you to do the same. You can use the chat to introduce yourself, just give us a shout out and say where you're from and where you're located at the moment. My name is Nick Verouden and I'm the program manager of the Design Across Cultures track at the Digital Society School. I will be your host for today. I will do that together with my dear colleague, Simona Macagnani. Always difficult to pronounce the name correctly. I hope <laughs> I had it, Simona. You did? Uh, the Design Institute in Italy. Well, for us, this is a special anniversary. It's the fifth time we're organizing the Global Goals Jam. Um, that's why we thought it would be nice to organize a pre-event where we bring the whole community together to reflect on the issues we've been working on. Kind of a celebration. Um, of course, uh, anniversaries are not only times for celebration, they are also times for reflection. They are times to look back on what has been achieved in the past and all the work that has gone behind it. Over in only five years, we started with a crazy idea together with the UNDP and we turned it in five years into a big global event in more than 90 locations and 5,000 jammers. Of course, we're very proud of that. Uh, it had brought us all kinds of fantastic gems over the year. Gems in big cities like Tokyo, but also on small islands like Sao Tome. Uh, not only has it brought us fantastic gems, it also created, uh, broadened our network, introduced us to great people, and created all kinds of new projects and initiatives around the SDGs. In addition to looking back, anniversaries are also a time to look forward. Of course, our landscape has fundamentally changed the last six months. Who could have imagined that in only six months, it would be impossible to jam in the way we used to do in the last years. Um, this has created a lot of challenges for us, of course. The whole idea of the jam is based on the idea of getting people together, letting them talk to each other, share ideas, prototype and make things. Uh, of course, that, is, uh, that makes it more difficult to organize the jam as we know it. But there's also good news, I think. Uh, looking forward, it creates new possibilities uh, to look at the jam and how it could, uh, uh, yeah, how events like the jam could function in the future. Uh, how do we take the power of such an event, which is spread across the globe, and how do we transform it into an event which is online, or at least bled? Uh, and what does this mean for creating new connections in a more sustainable way? That's why we chose the theme of today to be uh, back to the futures. Uh, what we would like to do is see what we have learned in the past, take from our experiences, insights, uh, and see how we can transform this idea to fit our current situation and broaden the path forward. Well, we have invited a great list of speakers for you today uh, to discuss these issues and many more. Speakers from all regions of the world, speakers with different perspectives of the jam, different perspectives on the SDGs, and difference involvement in the event. Uh, Simona, maybe you can uh, tell us a bit more about uh, the topics the speakers will talk about. Uh, thank you very much, Nick. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you again for joining us today. Um, as Nick already said, my name is Simona, and I am head of the Research Center at IED Instituto Europeo di Design and a long-standing ambassador and local organizer of the Global Goals Jam in Italy. So for me, it's, uh, of course, 
uh, an honor to be co-hosting this special event that, as Nick was saying, has brought together speakers from around the globe, inspiring amazing people, as well as an international community of passionate learners and change makers. We are all constantly learning um, concerning and regarding the SDGs. Today, we will be sharing insights, experiences, and of course, the challenges that relate to the interconnection between culture, creativity, and the tools and methodologies that come along with it, and the achievement of the sustainable uh, development goals. We will touch upon issues such as cultural and social, social bias, health and well-being in the digital era and the shift which is happening in design perspectives. So um, this of course puts together the past and the future not only of the jam but also of our life as, uh, as we know it. Now without any further ado I would like to call uh, on the stage Boaz uh, Paldi. Uh, Boaz is Global Partnership and Engagement Manager at the United Nations Development Programme. He and the UNDP are co-founders of the Global Goals Jam, so who better than him to get the conversation started? And as uh, Nick was saying, let's make this as interactive um, as possible. Boaz, the stage is all yours. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for having me here. This is a, this is a little bit nostalgic for me. I you know this started from a from a very simple conversation with uh, with Kate and with Mar with Marco, uh, a few, you know many years ago, um, and it grew into this incredible incredible achievement. I really believe that you know the global gold jams have had an enormous in impact on on development on on the well being of people around the world. Um, I know that our country offices, many many of them, have really taken this on as a as a as a as an important part of their year. Um, they look forward to the digital uh, digital uh, di uh, the the global goals jam. They they look forward to to this event. I also know that it's had impact already in the in the past five years. We've seen this take hold in various countries, uh, particularly places like Rwanda, where where digital innovation is so important the global goals jam really had an impact on the office on the government on the way that we uh, we do development um, it started another program in Rwanda that's still ongoing and is in, in, and is very very important to the Rwandan people um, um, but and and so we, we we have seen the impact of this already as we move forward but we are in a very very severe crisis at this time this, the the SDGs have never been more in danger. COVID-19 has put us back many, many years from where we were supposed to be. Uh, we, uh, we have in, um, unpleasant and, and frightening statistics. Um, 96 million people have gone back into extreme poverty since the beginning, just since the beginning of the crisis. Uh, and many, many more are going to, are going to fall back into extreme poverty as, as we move forward. Uh, we're going to see uh, countries uh, default on their loans. Uh, we're going to see... Uh, Places that are just going to uh, really have an enormous amount of, uh, of of trouble coming up in the next months. Um, so we have to work even harder. Um, this is the time to really apply ourselves, to apply all all our thinking, all all our all our great minds together to really try and solve some of the world's biggest problems. Plus the the enormous enormous crisis that covid has presented covid started as a as a as a as a medical crisis as a as a health crisis but has now become the most enormous socioeconomic crisis the world has ever seen um it's you know we are in a stage where where we we're looking at the at the, at the Great Depression of the 1920s, and this is going to be worse. Um, and so, and it's going to. What's what's interesting about COVID is that it's affecting um, um, the most vulnerable, the poorest, much, much more um, than it is uh, the, the 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 more well-off countries in the world, the more well-off people in the world. So, so this is really a time to apply ourselves. This is a time to really get down and to and to. Uh, uh, use every means possible to uh, to try and address this crisis and try and come out of it on the other end without too much loss that, that we have seen over the last six months. Um, and I think the Global Goals Jam is exactly the right attitude that we need to have um, and, and the right way to move forward. I applaud the, the community. I applaud the organizers. This is, a, this is an incredible uh, achievement um, and has just grown but 
to an enormous uh, degree in the last five years. Um, very, uh, you know, very, very proud to be part of this. UNDP is always proud to be part of this. We are, we, we ourselves, uh, uh, as an idea out of the out of the Global Goals Jam, have a giant program now that's that's really kind of like in over 36 countries around the world called the accelerator accelerator labs um the idea of the accelerate is very very similar similar to the global goals jam and it's really kind of was born out of it but now it's kind of a major part of what UNDP does a major part of our offer to our partners to our to our countries um so we also are thankful to the global goals jam for bringing these this kind of innovative thinking to us and making sure that that we are at the cutting edge of of design of um of this type of thinking when it comes to the sdgs the implementation of the sdgs and the achievement of the global goals um i i'm 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 excited for for this event i'm sure that you guys are going to have a wonderful time um and i'm sure that you're going to come up with incredible solutions that i can't wait to hear about um and i think that we we need to continue the conversation we need to continue uh this collaboration and i hope that i'll be here in in five years time again um and celebrate another anniversary um and any of those and and then when that comes I hope those are, are better times for us. Um, but really, a huge thank you to you guys and the community uh, for, for taking this on, for really applying yourselves and, and coming up with this incredible, first of all, this incredible format, this incredible idea, but also all the results, all the, all the achievements that we've seen over the last five years, and I'm sure that we'll see many more. So good luck to you guys. I'm, I'm, I'm excited, and uh, I'm, I'm, of course, I'll keep watching, and, um, and, and uh, please, Thank you, and and please continue. Well, thank you both so much for uh, you know introducing and for saying how much impact the Global Goal Jam is having. Of course, the ten years which are ahead of us are part of the decade of delivery of the SDGs. So it's even more important that we do all that we can do for the achievement of such uh, objectives. Um, I am very happy now to call on uh, stage uh, Mohamed Muse Hassan, uh, who I'm introduced before as founder and director of the Institute of Innovation, Technology, and Entrepreneurship at Simad University, uh, Jorik Helfenrich, le Learning Experience Designer and Facilitator, and Sanjay Gupta, Vice Chancellor at World University of Design, uh, Delhi, India, and also Gabriel Weirich, who is my colleague at the Global Goals Jam um, in, uh, in Italy, and for sure they will bring uh, um, extreme insight in different perspectives and global views on how to uh, tackle the global goals locally with a global uh, perspective. Thank you very much. Hello. Hello, everybody. Hello. So, hello. hello. So, I'm Gabriel Varich, and I'm uh, a very warm welcome uh, to everyone, and especially, obviously, to my first round of speakers, Mohammed Yorek and Sanjay, here with me. Um, I'm super excited and honored to be here today to act as a facilitator for this symposium organized by the Digital Society School and the Ed. And before we start, I have a note for our audience out there. If you have questions for our speakers, please put them in the chat so we can forward them to the speakers and discuss them during the session. You know, it's all about exploring and connection, therefore this would make sense. Uh, starting now with our first session, without further delay, I'm very happy to have you, Mohamed, Yorick and Sanja here to explore the topic of social and cultural bias in creative practices for sustainable development. As we have a quite tight time frame for our sessions, for around 25 minutes, I will ask each of you a question related to the topic and in the second part of the session we will leave space for questions from the audience or questions which emerged from your insights. So, I would like to start with Mohammed. Um, exploring the words social, culture and bias. What are some of the cultural issues you run into when working on challenges defined by the SDGs in your specific local context? And how do you try to bridge disciplinary, national or personal differences you may encounter? Uh, thank you very much, Gabriel. And hi, uh, panelists, Jorik and Sanjay Gupta. 
uh, and also hi to all the attendees uh, wherever you are in the world. Uh, first of all, my name is Mohamed Musa Hassan. I am a previous participant of the Global Gold Jam in Tokyo, and I'm also an organizer of the Global Gold Jam in Somalia, the first in the country. Uh, I'm the director of the Institute of Innovation, Technology and Entrepreneurship. Uh, we basically mentor uh, students in the country and we contribute to the uh, development of human capital for the recovery of the country, uh, our, our country, Somalia. Uh, coming back to your question, Gabriel, uh, in terms of the cultural issues we have and I encounter daily in our work when we do in, in design challenges for the SDGs. Basically, Somalia is a Muslim country. Uh, it's a very conservative, conservative country. And we are also one of the least developed countries in the world. So by, by having these three issues in mind, then I can talk about like where we stand in terms of the culture issues in the, in, 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 in the SDGs. Uh, it should not be surprising that because of these three issues that we have so many cultural bias in the society that have really put a lot of uh, challenges in front of us. One example that I would like to talk about is the SDG, SDG 5, uh, achieving uh, gender equality. Uh, this is a very, very sensitive issue that you cannot even openly talk about in, in the country. People will develop like their own perceptions toward where you're coming from and why you are advocating for this topic. One very good example is this yesterday, we had our parliament discussing about the sexual offense bill. And for the country, it was like a crazy topic because uh, talking about the sexual, the topic, the term itself sex in parliament was like perceived bad in the country. So you can say like, because of the nature of the society, the way our society is structured, we, 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 we as innovators, we as uh, designers of SDGs programs, we face a lot of challenges. And we, we have these issues to when we approach the society in, order, in, in terms of uh, discussing these topics. Uh, for example, when we say like, how might we design a program that increases girls' enrollment in schools? Yeah, This is a, one very good topic for the social development getting high enrollment for girls in the in schools will lead uh, development in the country. But then you will be challenging. You will be challenging like, why only girls? Why at this time you're focusing too much on girls? Why, or, or, or like, who are you representing when doing this? Yeah. So we have, those are the big issues we have in the country. But, uh, so that means empowering the people and, 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 and ensuring inclusiveness and equality is a big challenge that we have in the country. And these all are coming from the culture. And our culture is dominated by the religion. As I said, we are a very religious country and the culture is very influenced by the religion and people do not have like enough understanding of, 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 of the religion. So for that reason, uh, many topics cannot be openly uh, discussed. Uh, otherwise, people will have a lot of different interpretations. So uh, then again, coming back to the second part of, question, of your question, how do, how do we approach this? What do we do? Like, uh, how do we design interventions when we have all of this in the country? Uh, I would just summarize it in a three ways. The first is what we do is called like cultural localization of the SDGs. We, we, we translate the global language of the glo uh, SDG into understandable language and very compatible in our context so that we speak in a very simple understandable language by the local people so that they don't interpret our topic they don't just uh, make their own perceptions uh, and one very good example was the global goals jump in 2019 whereby we brought together people from the government people from the in, in, in private sector the, and the youth and then we openly discussed like how can we, uh, like one good topic that we had in SDA, GGG 2019 was in, in, in the SDG 4, the getting high quality education. So one of our topics was like, how do we ensure that we have more girls in the schools? And by just bringing those different people, by having templates on the table, by speaking the local language, then people were more accepted. Like they were more open to dis discussing like why 
we don't have more girls in, in schools. And the second thing is we try to build on cultural knowledge and resources so that we try to act as an enablers for development in the country. So we take one topic at a time. For example, in our context, the SDG 1, 2, 3, 4 are very imp more important and critical than the upper ones. So we focus on mainly those SDGs that are relevant and, 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 and critical in the country, in our context. And finally, we try to, as our hub, we try to act as a platform whereby we give people uh, a platform for expression, for creativity and for identity building. So that uh, one example is that all our programs do have 50% in, 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 in women participation. And we have women ambassadors. Uh, by doing all of this, we are creating a platform for, for in, in, in developing the, this new identity. Uh, and we are fighting against all of this. The, uh, like uh, we said, we have uh, an understanding that we think culture is something that changes from generation to generation. And thanks to the technology, uh, especially the social media, our people can see better practices around the world. And for that reason, they can be more and acceptive to our practices. Yeah, so thank, this is what we do. Thank you, Gabriel. Thank you very much, Mohamed. It was very intense insight, especially I took some notes of solutions you found and maybe we will find it also in insights from Yorick and Sanjay or there will be some questions from the audience. Um, going to the next, Yorick. Yes. How can, uh, my question to you, how can cross-cultural collaboration innovate processes and learnings to overcome unconscious bias? Can you perhaps give us an example of some of the hiccups or strands you have encountered and how this has changed your design practice and development for, of tools like the Empathy Game? Uh, yes, thank you, Gabriel. Um, I think for me personally, the most important part in cross-cultural collaboration is um, to be able to listen to each other and to be able to really reflect on our own assumptions. Um, how I usually describe it is this state of curiosity to be looking for uh, new, new ways of working because that is what creativity is. Um, to create something new, we have to try new ways of working. Um, and the best way to do that, in my opinion, is to learn from people uh, across the world. Uh, because we all have different challenges and face them in different ways. Um, and that might give us some insight in how to approach a challenge from a different direction, from a different perspective. Um, and how we do that, for example, with uh, the empathy game is uh, it's a tool that really tries to facilitate connection between people. Um, and we try to design it in such a way that it is that the game itself falls to the background and that it really focuses on the uh, people that you're playing with, uh, where active listening is uh, a very big part of that. Active listening, can you please uh, enlarge this concept of ex active listening? Yeah, thank you, that's a good point. Um, ac active listening is um, really trying to be there presently for the other person or other people you're having a conversation with um, and holding off from your own uh, initial responses. So have a little bit of a moment of reflection. How does it make me feel? Um, what, what do I think about these concepts? Do I know these concepts? Is this new for me? And uh, really approach it from um, trying to understand the other person instead of trying to put your own uh, mind on the table as fast as possible. So a lot of people generally listen uh, in a way so that they are actually just waiting for their turn to speak up, um, which makes them think about what, they're what they want to say and not actually listen to what the other person is telling them at that moment. And we call it active listening when we try to reverse that and really focus on, okay, what is this person telling me? And maybe I can 
feed that back to this person. So, okay, what I hear you say or how I interpret this uh, story that I just heard and have a little bit of a check-in with each other whether that is uh, correct. Thank you very much, Yorick. Um, I hope we will come later, back later to all these insights in our second round. Also, if each one of you has comments to someone from the other speaker would like that we then make a discussion, you uh, three basically and I will conduct it. Thank you very much. The next one is uh, Sanjay. In your experience as vice chancellor, is there a different approach between generations of designers? For example, have you noticed more inclusive processes and solutions in younger generations, in intergenerational design teams? Related to this, as Global Goals Jam organizer, what practices or tools have you implemented to facilitate the teams? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, yes, it is a very interesting, it has been an interesting journey for me. It is now four years since we started interacting with Global Goals Jam. Uh, uh, World University of Design is in north of India, and it is one university which brings together all streams, all creative streams under one umbrella. So we have art, architecture, design, and management within our uh, domain. Uh, so when we brought in the Global Jams, uh, what we could make out is the best solution would come only when we make it very inclusive. Now, India as a whole is a challenge, a cultural and social challenge, because, uh, you know, it is a very diverse. Diversity is something which is very, very strong in India. Uh, even if you speak about geographically uh, speaking, the north and south, if you just compare, completely different in terms of temperatures, lifestyles, languages, religious beliefs, uh, poverty, education percentages, everything is different. Uh, the difference, as Mohammed was talking about, gender equations, another thing which is also there. Professions are different uh, and, uh, you know, earning capacities are different. So everything changes every few hundred kilometers in India. And to be able to have a group of people together who can then cohesively and inclusively discuss uh, a project or an idea is something which we wanted to try. And uh, I think I would go back to the word used by Mohammed. The cultural localization is what we also did in the first instance, because otherwise it would not have been possible. You know, uh, the, our first uh, global jam focused on uh, waste management. Now, if you look at waste management, what how is happening in India is very different from how it uh, the, how the problem is uh, in the rest of the world. And so it had to be localized. And we brought in, uh, we advertised the Global Jams and promoted it all over, try to build in uh, uh, a fact so that designers and engineers and management people and financiers, they all come together so that we have a mix of a team which uh, finally sit down for the street uh, scripts. So that's how we manage, and I think a lot of uh, design schools and other people you also invited, so that is diversity. So on a whole, we usually manage about 40 to 50 uh, participants in one global jam into teams, uh, and then uh, we allow each team to pitch ideas, and then, uh, then the team by themselves finalize on one of the pitches, one of the ideas, and then the rest of the two days as uh, spent on pitching it. At various levels, we try to build in and bring in the government participation. For example, we have the Startup India uh, in, uh, collaborating with us, so that if any idea reaches the level of a, uh, you know, entrepreneurship where it can be taken up for a, uh, you know, funding and business, then Startup India is there. Uh, our second global jam was for uh, on health and well-being, and we brought in doctors from the National All India Institute of Medical Sciences uh, so that they brief about, you know, what they perceive as to the problem. And then they also mentor each group and see how each of the problem then 
uh, gets resolved and you know what is their perception of it so throughout the two days there are then experts from that related relative uh, you know the related uh, agents uh, industry uh, so as to continuously give them inputs or be there in case there are questions and in the end then we have them uh, pitching all the ideas to again a group of experts who then uh, try to tell them how to take it further so we try to make sure that all the ideas which gets generated is uh, translated into action and mm -hmm. we encourage and we have tried to uh, keep track of those people and many of the ideas have been taken forward by these people okay. so yes it has been a very interesting journey so far <laughs> Very nice. Thank you very much, Sanjay. So uh, I would uh, say we skip to our um, open part of, of our session. I will look here. I have from our audience outside. I have one question for Yorick. So the question is, is there a difference between active listening on and offline easier versus more or challenging? That's a very good question. Um, <laughs> And I, I immediately think of two parts of it. Um, the obvious one, we're not in the same space with each other, so uh, body language is completely uh, missing. We see a face behind the screen, um, and that is generally sort of all we get in a conversation. Uh, but then again, what online does offer us is that we give more time to actually let the other person finish. We have less interruption. Um, so therefore, we sort of can express what we want to say more easily. Um, so it has some pros, it has some, com, uh, some cons. Um, and if we are starting to become aware about these, then we can start to use them. Do you think there's a new, let's say, um, language science or visual science, as you said, obviously you don't have the body contact, yeah? Because it's a bit that what also we in our um, goal experience, yeah? Sometimes if a critics is very strong, if I the person in front of me, the person understands how I'm meaning this. Online, you have to behave in a different way. Yeah. Uh, what's the, the, the question? The question is, do you have found out or figured out that there are uh, some new rules, that you already crystallized new rules in this, how this new behavior is going on? Um, I personally, so what I like during my work mainly is to do as much of when it's remote, do my work more over phone calls than video because it gives me myself a bit more freedom in how I present. I feel like I'm presenting a lot right now, um, but I, I'm when I'm on the phone, I'd like to walk around, for example, and it feels to me that I can get to the point a bit faster uh, where there's a little bit more expectancy uh, during a video call to have this um, socializing aspect to it yeah. so in terms of new rules i would uh say like yeah we we are social creatures we'd like to socialize with each other uh but if we're really talking like work and effectiveness um i'm not so sure that video calls are always the right way to go okay Can I add a little bit? yes of course sure See, our experience of past four years has been that, uh, you know, because we would want everybody to travel to the university for these two days, the participation was limited to a certain geographical area. However, what was unique was that these people would stay back on campus and the real interaction would happen over the night and over the day. And that is something which we are going to miss uh, in this uh, digital platform, even as our reach has extended now, because, uh, you know, everybody, even from down south, thousands of kilometers away can participate. Mm -hmm. But that interaction, yeah. that level of interaction. Definitely. I have another question, as we are speaking about uh, cross-culture. Uh, Mohamed, for example, do you think it, it's an extra barrier if we speak about cross-culture and then we have new behavior rules or more my gesture is now becoming a little bit more important than it would have been in an offline mood and so on? 
Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Gabriel. Yeah, this is uh, very true, and especially at this time of uh, during the COVID-19, we becoming uh, more global, and uh, by just like in this event, by seeing the way we communicate now, I can understand how the Kujoric communication, how Senji does the same, and how me coming from a country like Somalia to communicate. Yeah, so it, that question itself carries the issue of uh, nah, nah, nah. we are not as far as we think we are. We are more closer than we So we we as humans do communicate the same. So uh, by just being open and, and respectful to the way we do would enable us to be more uh, acceptant to, to, to each other. So I, but I would say, yeah, the, during this time, uh, the online events has enabled us all to to, to, to feel like we are more into one family. Mm -hmm. I have then, thank you very much. I then here a round up question for open to all of you who wants to jump in, start. So uh, by my notes, I took from your insights. I think these questions sums it up quite well. Uh, for example, given the impact of culture and cultural heritage on creativity, what are some of the limitations of global design toolkits when applied to the SDGs? I can, I can uh, start answering from my perspective. Um, <laughs> Toolkits, um, I have sort of a, a hate-love relationship with tools, um, but mainly because I see it as, for example, as a carpenter uses a hammer or a screwdriver and knows when to use what tool. There's no carpenter out in the world saying, I only use a hammer uh, because it doesn't make sense. But a lot of the times, uh, tools and methods in the design world are being presented as a one size fits all. Design thinking is going to solve all our problems. Agile, Lean, Scrum are all sort of, some people are so dedicated to one method or one tool that I start to sort of feel a bit agitated about that. So then I start thinking, is the tool in itself a goal or is it just there to facilitate? And uh, in my opinion, a tool is just a facilitation uh, of an actual goal that we try to achieve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very true, very true. Yeah. Because I think uh, for us, uh, you know, many of the tools cannot be translated immediately and we have different languages and vernaculars mm -hmm. here. So we try to make, uh, you know, try to attempt to convert many of the tools to our vernacular, and our, you know, uh, cultural contexts. And those we can and those we think can fit in our responses, we use. But otherwise, we may not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and if you. I add on there, uh, the design tools are good and they have been like, we did a good job in terms of designing tools for our problems. But then sometimes, as Jorik and Sanjay have said, by taking the context into, 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 into mind, then we can design useful tools in, in, in all over the world. Like for example, now we have technologies that do facial recognition, yeah? But then again, now we realize that we have some racist issues in, in those technologies. But if you would have taken care of our design process, if you have had more diversified users uh, when we did those designs, if we, had, if we thought like as a global users, then I, th I, I believe the, the value of those technologies would have been much better than they are now. And if we, when we do the prototypes, if we could test with different people with different backgrounds, then that would put us our tools in a more better positions. It cannot be very one, much more. It Sorry. cannot be one size fits all. Absolutely. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, all of you. Unfortunately, as we have a very tight time frame, we already end at the end of our session. So I would say thank you so much, Mohamed, Yorik, and Sanjay. It was a way too short talk about all the complexity dealing with social and cultural bias in creative practices for sustainable development. But I think anyway, the discussion will go on. Yeah, I think thank also the audience much. had a very nice uh, different views and insights from the, your perspective. So again, thank you very much. Thank you, thank Gabriel, you. for having us. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye.
So I'm uh, actually, I think this uh, conversation could have been gone on and on and on. I liked a lot that we had different perspective from Yurik, which spoke about um, active listening. We had from Somalia uh, that the culture and religion uh, connection that we have the localization of the SDGs and Mohamed spoke about the cultural localization. So we had already a lot of um, interfaces here from these different point of views. So I think therefore very um, interesting and I hope there will be a follow up on this. Thank you all for that uh, very, very interesting uh, conversation. Uh, I heard a lot of interesting things about uh, the differences that are involved in SDG projects, cultural localization, active listening, all things that are very, uh, very important, I would say. Uh, we would like to go to our second round of interviewees. Uh, it's on the topic of the human-centered design, the move from human-centered design towards SDG-related design. Uh, we have three speakers again. Uh, the first one is Nadim Chokair, if I pronounce it correctly again, another difficult name. He's a Lebanese-Canadian who is based in Berlin. His mission is to accelerate progress towards the 2030 agenda through building all kinds of partnerships. Nadim works as an innovation consultant, as an ecosystem partnership manager at Adventure in Berlin, and has started his own cabinet 2030. He's a well-known speaker and moderator at conferences and events, and he's initiator of our Global Goals Jam in Berlin. Our second speaker for, today, for the second round will be Daniela Moya from Argentina. She's a service designer at the Design and Innovation Consultancy Institum, now part of Fjord. Here she worked as a design and innovation consultant for strategic projects. Daniela was a real key, play, a key player in our Global Gem Institute, Latin America Global Goals Gem 2019. And our final speaker is Takusho Inamura, professor at Kyushu University uh, in the lovely city of uh, Fukuoka. He has worked uh, in the research and education industry in different fields related to design. Uh, he's also very focused on making impact and making the world to, uh, for a truly sustainable future. He's also organizer of the Global Goals Jam Fukuoka. I'm looking very much forward to them. We can bring them on stage uh, and I will do a conversation. Would you like to start, Daniela? Sure, thanks. <laughs> well, it was really a nice introduction that Nick gave, so thank you and thanks for, for the opportunity to be speaking with you and hearing also the interesting conversations. Um, what, can I, what I can add maybe about myself and the work we do at Fjord is that may, maybe um, the, how, how we relate to life-centered uh, life design, right? How, mm -hmm. how we came into it. We actually do every year as Fjord, we develop a trend report where we crowdsource trends uh, from within Fjord and outside Fjord and we try to, to understand uh, what the trends will be for the year ahead. And actually in Fjord Trends Report 2020, life-centered design was actually one of the seven highlighted trends where we explore the shift from, well, from me to we and how we are changing towards design for all life. Mm -hmm. and it, uh, we'll talk more about it, but uh, it has been an interesting uh, shift that we are, are, are still experiencing. I'm very excited about. Daniela, thank you very much. I got here a message from, from backstage that we should uh, start with our conversations on uh, Tokushi will um, uh, join us later. So obviously, thank you that uh, already you two are here. And I'm lucky to discuss now with you the shift in perspectives from human-centered design to design for life design for the sustainable development goals with obviously with you Daniela, Nadim and Tokusha which will which will come later and also here for the audience please to remember or if you joined us only now um, I would like to address each of uh, I would like that if you have questions from the audience post it on the chat so we can introduce it in our discussion later on I would start also here in this session with a question for each of you, and then later on uh, we will have an open discussion. I would like to start with you, Nadim. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In your professional practice as an ecosystem builder and as global goals jam organizer, have you often uh, noticed any difference in the endorsement of the change between sectors, private versus public, etc.? 
And if so, how do you see the role of designers in supporting a more comprehensive SDGs purpose driven shift? Thanks so much, Gabriel. Great to be here with, with all of you. Uh, I, this is a really cool question because I think, um, you know, I, I started 2030 cabinet just about a year ago um, mm -hmm. and on this mission that, that Nick uh, mentioned. Um, and I saw that in 2019, actually, there was this sort of an awakening for the private sector. Um, the fact that it took them for four years to adopt the SDGs and get on track um, was, was for me surprising. Uh, the, pri the public sector um, was, was much earlier on the train because the SDGs were sort of, uh, let's say, um, uh, formulated in a way and presented in a way that as if it, it, you know, you're talking much more towards the, the public sector. Um, but the common thing that I found, um, you know, between the private and the public sector is the fact that the commitment and the contribution towards the 2030 agenda um, is to a certain extent still very much at a surface level, right? So you only see pockets, um, you know, within different organizations where there is deep enough knowledge. But in some of the workshops we run with 2030 cabinet, uh, we, you know, we sort of get people to, to formulate for us, yes, we contribute to X and Y goals. And then we ask them, okay, how do you contribute? They don't really have an answer. Um, and, and they have really a very broad spectrum of whichever SDG they contribute to. And they, you know, it becomes a bit of plastering all the icons around. Um, and I think that's, um, that's a bit the challenge is, is we need to move to, to a different level of commitment as, or endorsement, as you say, um, of, of this change, of this agenda of transformation, uh, to really have it an integral part of strategy. Um, the, the whole, you know, my whole relationship to this topic actually was when I wrote my thesis back in 2016 about integrating the SDGs into a design thinking framework. Um, and to build on your point, I mean, design thinking is not the only way forward, but it was one that I chose. And I called it sustainability by design. So basically, you know, um, what is, <coughs> sorry, what is the problem we are trying to solve? And I think with the, with the SDGs, um, we have what we, you know, designers, but also everyone um, have this framework, right? Um, have this uh, uh, amazing starting point to actually select the right problems to solve for. So um, what I see in the role of the designer going forward is um, demystifying the 2030 agenda. Um, well, I see a role and I see a responsibility. So two things, right? Mm -hmm. um, in a role, I say demystifying the 2030 agenda, but making sure it is really um, at the basis of whatever we're designing for and why we are designing in a very important manner, but also to play on this idea of that designers should always ask these five whys, uh, but maybe designers should be emboldened a bit to ask, so what, right? So if whatever we're in a design process and whatever we're designing for, um, if we're not designing for something that answers to, see, to these 17 goals, that making our world a better place and just, you know, maybe time to ask, so what? Like, um, let's, let's go back to, to really understand if, if, we're, if, if we started off at, at the right point. Um, so in a way, what I'm trying to say, maybe the role that designers could have is to be rebels um, and, and, and sort of put the pressure up uh, a bit within, within organizations. But at the same time, there's a responsibility. I think the goals, demystifying them and decomplexifying them is, is one thing. But at another end, um, you know, it is a system. We're working within a big system. So I think we, we should uh, look at systemic design, uh, not only uh, seeing how, how we approach it now and, and um, see how to use the SDGs effectively to drive, forward, uh, uh, to drive forward that type of change. So I'll stop it here and I can come back and, and comment on, on, on other questions if need be. Okay, thank you very much, Nadim. Uh, Tokushu, nice to have you here. Do you do you have the do you have your audio on? Oh yeah. Can you hear me clearly? Yeah, I can hear you clearly. Can we Great. maybe start also to ask you a question, Tokushu? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Thinking about the shift in perspectives from human centered design to design for life design, could you explain what this shift means to you as a designer? What is it to you and what is what is important in your research and work? 
Was there, for example, a, a particular aha moment in your work as an organizer in projects that were more human-centered, that made you adapt to a more designed for SDGs approach? Hmm. Okay, so that's that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Um. So I'm in the Faculty of Design at, um, in Kyushu University, and I teach in uh, Fukuoka City. Um. And actually, just to tell a bit about myself, we in Fukuoka, we are like the first city in Japan to organize the Global Goals Jam, and we've been there since the first year, coming on from an older event, which was focusing on uh, universal design for the city, and we kind of merged it into Global Goals Jam. So that's the context for my end, but I, I started off um, participating, uh, but gradually got roped into this. And um, I'm glad you asked me this question because my main research focus now is on post-human-centered design. So what is coming post, uh, so human-centered design, but what is post, okay? Uh, that's kind of a real question for me. And um, I was looking for an aha moment and I was almost about to say that it was gradual, but actually I did have a moment. In 2015, we ran a project with um, the innovation design program in the Royal College of Art, uh, led by Savina Torisi. She used to teach me over there. And uh, our side was led by Yasuyuki Hirai, who's doing the um, design across cultures program lead with Nick. So uh, back then we were in like a one week project, getting uh, multidisciplinary designers, kind of like the GGJ. Uh, but each team had one of our professors from Japan join a bunch of these artists and designers. And one intriguing team, uh, we had a teacher, uh, professor, uh, Chihiro Hiramatsu. She's a biologist. And uh, the team came up with this way of like uh, interrogating the self and really thinking how we can create a new relationship with yourself. And how they did that was to think of a scenario in the future where you'd be able to fully explore the internal microbiology of your own body. And uh, right. so, so it's like a kind of head mount display prototype like a mock-up and you'd crawl inside your own body and could see all the microbiome and um this was really really interesting like the in this that, in that story the group of students and uh chihiro they extracted a harmful bacteria from their own body but uh, they could also see what the good bacteria was to them and um and then i kept on thinking about this thing and uh, uh i then kept on researching and actually only 43 percent maybe of the human body is actually made of human cells. The rest is all like bacteria and like viruses and other things that are not really human. And so that means that like a human body is actually a colony. So no doctor can say like two twins are exactly the same because the colony is different. It's a different civilization. You two are different spaceships. So this is a kind of medical basis of current design. And uh, so that's why I'm trying to reframe what the real reality of design is, is that we can't design for individual humans anymore because we actually are individually colonies. And the second point um, I'd like to say is that I grew up in um, Aotearoa, New Zealand, uh, and I was exposed to the indigenous worldview of uh, Maori people and uh, like lots of things like the food, uh, mythology about like Maui and uh, lots of conversations. And they really have a thought that they're inseparable from nature um, and community. And uh, between the self and the connection to nature is like really connected. So uh, I'm researching the Wanganui River, which runs about 300 kilometers in the North Island, goes from like these snowy peaks all the way down to the, the beach. And uh, everybody there has this kind of saying that I am the river and the river is me. So we are inseparable. And actually, uh, this kind of belief uh, kind of pushed them to fight the government for about 100 years. And now their river is being given uh, personhood legally. So this, in my mind, is like a major way to address the SDGs and that they give given legal status for a whole bio region. So uh, this kind of shift to, uh, of, from human-centered design is kind of on a micro level and both on a macro level, really like kind of the defining thing that of um, the way I understand the change from human-centered design to what's coming afterwards. Yeah. Thank you very much to Kushu. Um, going quickly to Daniela, because we, are, we have already questions from our audience outside. 
So, Daniela, I would ask you, has shifting from human-centered design to design for life naturally broadened the scope of your innovation design and research? And how does it relate to creating new and better products, service, experience and brands? And on the flip side of this, do you think a design for life SDGs framework can have its limitations? If so, how? Yes. Um, well, actually, to talk about a bit of what Nadim was saying about the awakening uh, of the sector, it's funny because I'm going to be very honest about this. We as Fjord for the past years have been very passionate advocates for people-centered design and human-centered design, right? Being human-centered has been a response to innovations that were product-centered or were focused only on the company's uh, uh, desires or, or objectives and wouldn't take into account the people that would actually benefit from it. And I think this is the case for many other innovation firms and companies who have decided in the last years to take people into account, right? So actually, yes, thinking from, uh, of life-centered design instead of human-centered is a change we are all experiencing in the past years, especially uh, at a bigger, a larger organizational level. But maybe what I would like to highlight is that moving from human-centered design into life-centered design is not a dismissal of uh, people's needs and voices, but it's actually a way to, as you say, broaden our, pers our perspective, right? It's a way to think uh, of people's needs, but also to think beyond them and see a more holistic picture where we consider the society, where we consider the economy, environment, where designers need to have, and everyone who is involved need to have a systemic thinking. And and this is and this will change our way. Uh, this is changing our way, uh, the way we look at innovation, right? And this will bring on new questions and therefore new ideas, new answers that have. Uh, never been explored before because we weren't asking the questions. And as to the limitations of the SDG framework or as, or, or this life-centered design framework, uh, it, it, I think it comes back to a bit of what uh, they were saying in the last panel about tools, uh, mm -hmm. the, which is that in order for it to be effective, we have to understand why we are using it, what will be the impact for the ones involved, how will we use it and to what end. And for communities, maybe this might mean if we use this framework, this might mean helping communities understand in a tangible way how this will help them, right? Or with companies, the same, adopting models that will help them see the impacts of their actions and achieve the growth they're looking for because it's inevitable in this private sector. But adopting ESG criteria, for example, or circular business models, so it's kind of a... It needs to have like a value translation. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Daniela. I would like to go to the open part. Uh, there is one question for all of you. And uh, why do you create so many terminologies while it is already confusing for non-designers to catch what is human-centered design or service design? Life-centered design could be sustainability-centered design or global goal-centered design as well. The floor is all yours. <laughs> Who? Yes? I'd like to raise a point yeah. about this, is that when you have a conversation about sustainability, and I know that a lot of people who uh, have to make uh, impact in the next quarter know about this a lot. But you talk about sustainability and you have to talk about the three different areas of like economy, society and environment. And usually you start from an environmental crisis when you raise the issue. But the, by the end of the conversation, you're talking about metrics, which are economic. So I, I just want to raise a point that you do need to think in terms of the true complexity of the biosphere we live in and then account for that in an appropriate way through design. And sometimes a conversation can start one way but end up lapsing to business as usual so that's kind of my point mm -hmm. Daniela, I, agree. I, I i think it, it's uh, um yeah it's sort of a, an existing bias in how we drive this conversation always towards these economic metrics metrics i i fully agree and um to a certain extent i think it influences also this this almost um uh, i don't know naming challenge Right, because uh, it, it almost seems like uh, 
there's there's a sense of, of ownership, right? So if we put this this name or this new tool or whatever system out there, uh, then also more people could use it, which um, yeah has 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 both effects. I think Harvard wrote Harvard Business Review wrote about the um, uh, the coming of age of design thinking, I think it was in 2009, and then with, with IDEO, like, uh, you know, uh, making it popular, just everybody was, was able to identify with it. So that's the, the, the added value of it. Um, but then um, as long as, I think Daniela mentioned, you know, as long as we know why we're doing this, so whether it's, I wrote an article, we called it humanity-centered design, and then people told me, call it planetary conscious design. Um, but uh, there's there's so much variations of it. I think coming back to the why um, is 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 perhaps the answer. There is why are we designing um, to improve life for humans on this earth, uh, and then go from there. Um, what you know what needs to happen or what needs to, not to happen so that there is an improvement um, is is um, is I think where yeah where our starting point should be. Daniela, do you want to add something? Or? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. Labels are very confusing, and especially we are very fond of them in the design and business world. <laughs> and uh, I think that's what we should do. Maybe just uh, take a look at the content, have the conversations, and have have it call uh, all the things we want and try to, to move away from, from just uh, fixing in the world and more talking about the, the content of it. Okay, thank you. I think there is another question coming up, but it's not popping up by now. I think that what I was understand that Nadine wanted to answer also or make a um, speak about uh, the question from Daniela. Is it right? Or yeah, I mean, it was for me. This was this question was super interesting. Um, it, it reminds me of a quote by uh, Laszlo Moholy Nagy from the Bauhaus, who said, um, "At the end, every problem comes down to one." Uh, to one problem, which is design for life, um, and I think, like when we, whether again, when we, whatever we call it, uh, life-centered design, etc. I think just the the critical eye on how design has been had been applied so far was uh, designing for human life and very specific time frames within a human life with a with a really focused attention. And Tokusho, I think you can also, you know, in your post-human-centered design studies, you can you can enlighten us more, but focusing really on 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 a very small scale of where we are in this planet and i think it it tended to disregard a bit you know in what context human life is uh, which is on this planet so um that's that's only what i wanted to say is uh, it's as if every problem goes into design for life except that specific problem which is you know the life the life we've been designing for so far and uh, and how we can broaden that scope Thank you very much. Uh, yes, now I've got also the, the next question. Uh, when we talk about the paradigm, paradigm shift in design from me to we, we probably talk about morphing or getting rid of existing social interaction. Who do you think can infuse the elements of change or be invasively proactive in fast tracking the social transitions in backward places like Somalia to finally end up in an egalitarian world, even in terms of design thinking. So I think the third part is that we are getting rid of uh, existing social interaction. We are morphing. And who do you think can infuse elements of change to be invasively proactive and fast tracking for the social transitions in backward places like Somalia? Hmm. Well, uh, maybe I'll, I'll say a couple of things on that. Is that uh, maybe the hind part? I can think that the the effort in global goal stem and the great thing, for example, uh, when you're organizing or you're part of the group, you can see people are organizing these stamps all over the world um, in Japan and in uh, in Europe, the African continent, uh, you know, all, all over North American continent, the South American continent. And you find that great people are everywhere. And and I, I kind of 
would uh, maybe not say that um, disregarding as backward maybe would be not the right way, but there are good people around that region all over the place who are active and um, with the ways of uh, sharing this kind of uh, tools that we talked about are also ways that they can make a change. So I think, you know, you look at uh, prosperous and uh, growing, changing places all over Africa can can surround the most hard hit places and, and try to make a positive contribution. So I think the neighbors first, but uh, from our end, also, we try to make positive general, you know, improvements. So that's that's my point. Mm -hmm. Daniela, do you want to add something? Yeah, I was, I was uh, reading the question. It uh, had uh, different parts. But um, yeah, I mean, go, going from me to we, I think part of it is what Tukushu is talking about, which is uh, from the individual uh, level and the community level and group level. But um, for that to happen and for uh, how, it's funny how they say invasively proactive about it. Yeah. The the, um, the 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 institutions that are running right now are worn and also have a really great impact in our in our systems are big uh, capitalistic organizations and governments, not right. So these uh, change from me to we also has to happen at that larger level. And that means uh, when we design products and services and we, and we put out something out there, it has to take into account, uh, for example, not only what's the individual need of someone, but what will be the impact in, in a whole community, what will be the like, political um, uh, consequences of that thing we put out there. And uh, hopefully that will be something that uh, it, it will in, uh, be even more common to see in the larger organizations just to see from that point of view yeah okay thank you well the, do you want to add something nadine because it's a very very complex question yeah quite complex indeed i think um you know what what Tokusho mentioned also previously about the maui's and and uh yeah, I, I'm just taken aback a bit by this, um, by, by the characterization of, of backward places. And, and perhaps I just want to turn that on its head and say that maybe we should go backward, right? Like exactly, be, you know, uh, what our ancestors were about being one with nature and, and, uh, and being more, um, you know, uh, we are the invasive ones in a way. So it'd be, how do we, how do we get that, that idea, that idea of how we existed before? To be, to be, uh, uh, I don't know, to to infuse the way we we connect socially, but also we connect with our environment, uh, is is perhaps the question. I mean, um, you know, we mentioned things like the need to maintain growth and how we think of the private sector's involvement in this, uh, but there's a lot around how do we look at degrowth, how do we decouple uh, 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 growth from from how do we get to regeneration. Um, uh, I mean, I'm going in all types of directions, but I think that perhaps the question is is um, understanding what you know where we came from originally and how we were actually get to a certain extent back to that. Maybe yeah. maybe that's what I would say. Yeah, maybe. Okay. Thank you very much. Our time is over, unfortunately. Thank you so much for this very enlightening conversation. So I say bye to Daniela, Tokushu, and Nadim. While we wait for our next speakers to join um, the stage, uh, I would like to, um, you know, start uh, perhaps introducing them. But uh, as uh, Gabriel was also saying, we've seen a lot of crossovers. Uh, between the topics and connections uh, between the speakers. So I want to thank uh, again also Nadim, Daniela and Tukoshu. Um, again, many contact points with some of the issues and some of the approaches that also Mohamed, Sanjay and Yorick uh, brought to the conversation and to the stage, which is exactly the kind of approach that JAM is supporting and intends to facilitate. So conversations as are the SDGs related you know, topics 
tactics, methodologies, and objectives, and change maker like our speakers, and as well as our international community, which is participating to today, are absolutely um, interlinked and connected and pick up from from one another, which makes you know these conversations um, not uh, in vertical silences, but of course they will always. Uh, be um, again crossovers and cross fertilization and we see also that the questions coming in from the audience are uh, more and more articulated uh, yes. I think because uh, <laughs> which makes uh, well which makes the conversation uh, even more challenging which is, which is which is great so I want to thank again the community for uh, helping us build uh, this event again it's exactly what we need to do uh, when working towards the SDGs so one thing which perhaps um, I see as a as a main uh, common thread between the first two uh, conversations and which I think will um, help us uh, delve into uh, our third conversation which is about to start is we're talking about a sense of purpose um, and this is something which is becoming more obvious as we continue working towards the SDGs and towards working, and uh, sorry, and working towards a more uh, sustainable, equitable, and um, and also I would say planet of um, of well of well being. So our um, next speakers will be concentrating on a concept which is related to distance and um, desire, desirability, uh, health and well-being, which as we heard early this morning was, uh, of course, something which is particularly contemporary given the current COVID situation. So our speakers today um, for this third session are Shinochiro Ito. He is lecturer at Kyoto Sanjo University, Faculty of Information Science and Engineering. Shin is passionate about education in inclusive design and digital fabrication field. And his personal motto is designing is empowering. And he has been a um, Global Goals Jam organizer since 2016. So for sure, he will be able to bring his perspective um, to the conversation as well. We then have Stephanie Helu. Stephanie is an Argentinian living in Germany, uh, cross-cultural uh, already within one single person. Uh, she has, uh, hi Stephanie, thank you. She has 10 years experience in design and innovation. And she has recently been appointed honorary representative of the city of Buenos Aires in Munich, and she's an advocate of cross-cultural collaboration and public-private sector partnerships towards achieving the 2030 agenda. And least but not last, um, sorry, but last but not least, <laughs> apologies for the mess up, Kelsey Stewart. She is a chief community officer at Fab Cafe. Uh, Kelsey strategizes and analyzes fab synergies to empower everyone to make the initiative, uh, to make and share their ideas within local and global contexts. So thank you all um, for being here. And uh, Gabriel, the stage is back to you and specifically to the speakers that are with you. Thank you so much. So, Hello, Kelsey, Hi. Stephanie, and Shin. Nice to have Hi. you here. We are in our Hello, final pleasure session. Hello, to be here. We are in our final session, and yeah, really nice that you could join us for this conversation about distance and desirability. And during this conversation, we will zoom in and zoom out of the theme of health and well-being in the communities of the digital age. A uh, little note for again for our audience outside. If you have questions to our speakers, please put them on the chat. And we, in the second part of our session, we will uh, throw them into the discussion. I would like to start in, jump in immediately. So I would like to start with Kelsey. Um, how has COVID nineteen influenced your global goals jam of? wider community building and engagement activities and practices. Great. So first, thank you so much for having me. It's my true pleasure to be here today. Um, this is my first time joining on a hop in as a speaker, so it's exciting. Um, great. So uh, just to give everybody in the room who maybe doesn't have a lot of context for what Fab Cafe is or what it is I'm doing, it's not the most user-friendly um, understanding. Basically, I work at a creative community hub and digital fabrication cafe. We host a lot of different creative communities. And the one that I'm uh, managing 
mostly is the Global Goals Jam community here in Tokyo. And so for your question, maybe I'll like flip it upside down. I'm going to talk a little bit about the global creative communities and how our activities with them have changed. And then I'll tell a little bit about more what I've been doing with my Global Goals Jam community. So basically, um, in the very beginning when COVID-19 hit, there was a huge movement with makers trying to create and fabricate themselves uh, personal protective equipment, uh, respirator equipment, um, you know, making face shields, uh, putting all of this on the internet so people can download it. You know, Creative Commons is beautiful. People are getting this data for free and printing it themselves, laser cutting it themselves and distributing it widely. This democrat democratization of manufacturing was really beautiful. And so just in general, like I was also quite impressed and moved at this like global energy of makers around the world that were really responding to the crisis really quickly. Um, that being said, you know, it's medical equipment that we're talking about. So there are certain regulations and rules that people have to follow so that it's safe. And so for example, one of the communities that we actually started very quickly, this was in mid-March, was a how to make it safe meetup. So actually this was um, about a hundred people were joining online. I believe there was four sessions and it was directed specifically at makers. Um, it was a Japanese event, uh, but directed specifically at makers who wanna make a difference and they have the tools, they have the skills, but they don't know how to make it safe. <laughs> so that was one of the first things that we did was um, basically gather all these makers from around the J Japan um, to try to centralize their efforts and to make it safe. So that was one of the things that we were doing, which was great. Um, it's nice because the, the maker community, there's this sense of family, there's this sense of, you know, we're all doing this for like pure or, or good reasons. So that was really great. Um, that's one community thing. Besides that, like basically for me, actually this is something I learned just today. I was doing a kind of analysis of myself. Since April, I've either hosted or spoken at 15 online events and wow. in front of 483 people because we're not doing offline right now. We're not doing anything offline. Um, look, I'm, I'm signing in from Tokyo today and luckily Tokyo is in a better place than it was before, but, and my, comparatively it's, it's, it's okay. Um, thank you, masks. <laughs> I can't say it's because of I can't say it's because of any strategy from our government or something like this. But <laughs> um, <laughs> but anyways, uh, that being said, yeah, we've been doing a lot of online stuff, and um, some of it's been great, some of it's been mixed. Um, I myself going down to GGJ, uh, I was a little bit uh, ch I guess challenged is the best word to use, or even intimidated um, to use Miro. Like I had not used an online whiteboard tool before. Um, so to kind of prep myself for that, uh, I had a half day mini jam um, for SDG 14 Life Below Water. And for that, I learned that, yeah, there's a lot of, um, how do you say, like two sides of one coin happening. So you can connect local and global. You can connect physical and virtual. You can connect, you know, um, all of these seemingly uh, opposite things, but actually they're, they're part of the same coin. And that was, yeah, really, really big insightful moment for me. Also, yeah, since we can't do offline events and we're still not doing them, um, we've been hosting a lot of talk events, um, really short workshops, doing some online prototyping. Um, and it's great, but of course there's gaps. There's still gaps happening. Like we haven't been able to get past the communicative dissonance that happens online. It's like, for example, Maybe Stephanie or, or Sheen has something to say to me, but they're chilling out because <laughs> right now I'm like <laughs> holding this mic, right? So anyways, that's, that's, that's what's been going on here. Yeah. Thank you very much. Can you a little bit uh, give us a quick um, wrap up of other gaps you found out? Oh, quick wrap up <laughs> about gaps. So, I think you will have a big collection also. <laughs> no, right. Gaps. So, um, Ma, someone mentioned earlier this kind of human feeling because you're not in person, right? So any kind of cough or laugh or hiccup or, um, you know, subtle movement, this body language thing is very difficult uh, to bring mm -hmm. across. Um, so, for example, whenever we do small team uh, 
So we have like the big team, right? Like all the, everybody's in the big Zoom, and then we have the breakout yeah. rooms. Um, one kind of like more or less rule that we have is whenever you're in the small rooms, uh, you can't use mute. Uh, you can only use mute if it's like, you know, you have construction going on in the background and it's impossible okay. for other people to hear you. Because once you go on mute, that gives you that anonymous permission. So you, you can you can step back and just watch. And Global Goals Jam is not about stepping back and watching. It's about being actively participating. So, um, yeah, just small trick is we, we say no mute for anybody. Um, we also use a lot of background music. Uh, we still do energizer games. Um, but yeah, it's still it's still tough. Ma, it, good things are yeah. happening too. Um, it's really great for documenting. It's it's very easy yeah. to keep all the information because it's all there on the board, right? Um, mm -hmm. But there's a certain human aspect that is still difficult to make touch with, and I'm hoping that uh, maybe augmented reality or virtual reality in the future <laughs> will help us out with that. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kelsey. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to jump to Stephanie. Are yep. there all, also new ways of working that open up new opportunities for global events like the Global Goals Jam? For example, related to access, which now moves from physical to digital spaces. And what does it mean to our mental and physical health? What do we do to foster, what do you do to foster a healthier and work environment? Which leads also a little bit in that what Kelsey said, also there's, I met, there's an interconnection. Indeed. Thank you, Gabriel. And also thank you, Kelsey, for uh, taking us through your experience. I think super valuable learnings that, uh, as you may have seen us, we were just nodding, right? Uh, I think it's something that we're all experiencing as we uh, go online at scale uh, and speed, right? So I think a couple of points, right? So when you work with innovation, when you work with design, when you work really with people, right? So what we're talking about is human interaction. Um, there's something that we have been seeing that is not new, which is, you know, the growth uh, of digital channels as something that complements what we do face to face, right? So this is nothing new. Uh, now, what has happened since the pandemic hit, uh, I think in March, and what Kelsey was just describing is, you know, the speed and the scale of how that got accelerated, simply because, you know, the physical was suddenly out of scope for a lot of us due to, of course, health concerns, safety concerns, right? We want to protect people first. Uh, mm -hmm. And therefore, um, we try to think about different ways. And of course, you know, all the availability of digital channels to connect like this space have made this possible. So I think, you know, th th that's one big thing. Suddenly, all our life seeming to go online right so the birthday yeah. parties the meetings the shopping for the groceries everything right and it's a bit overwhelming right so that's also i think a feeling that we all must have felt at one point or the other no matter how we how familiar we are with those technologies right or how literate we are in the digital space um now when we look at events like the global gold jam or you know what we're doing here this conversation that i think is fantastic having people from all over the world. Um, for sure, let's say we, we do miss that human touch. We do miss that, you know, let's grab a coffee and speak about something else. And suddenly it feels like when we have an agenda online, we are more like, okay, now we need to go next. Now we can put the timer, right? So mm -hmm. it feels like much more structured. And we sometimes miss that, how do we loosen it a bit online, right? Um, at the same time, I think in terms of access, this has really um, opened up for many more opportunities, right? So um, what we had before as a physical barrier where people would just sign up to the jam of the city nearby or the city that they can manage to make it to over the weekend or something like this, visit a friend, organize this. Uh, right now, this has disappeared, this barrier of the space, right? So anyone can join. Uh, within the constraints of, you know, maybe it's language and time zone, right? New barriers that arise, but anyone can be part and it, it's a completely different skill and opens up for a lot more, if you want participation, uh, collaboration and internationalization of that 
and I think this is uh, simply fantastic. From what I've experienced personally, it opens up for also new interactions and bringing more people in. Um, so, for instance, if we look at you know the entertainment industry, I think they have been doing this really well, right? So uh, there are now movies that cannot be released in the cinemas, being released on different platforms, right? And there are now concerts happening face to face. However, the format is changing a lot. So I was just seeing in London, they built stages like everyone has their own VIP with safe distance, right? So it's also like how when we go back to physical, um, because with time, the regulations will loosen and hopefully we will overcome the uh, safety concerns, how physical changes as well due to this experience that we've all had. Um, so I think this is really exciting for everyone you know with a creative spirit uh, with a design driven mindset to think about opportunities from a different perspective um so i think w when we go back to the other side of the question which is basically you know how do we accommodate right uh, and and mm -hmm. how do we bridge from a health and well-being angle, that new reality. Um, so I still think, and I feel personally that we are still in a period of adjustment, uh, right? So I'm speaking from a client location where we are having a rooftop workshop, right? Which mm -hmm. would have been very bizarre before that. Um, and, and, and actually it's going really well, but you see that the interactions are different. So I think the first thing is, you know, taking that time to adjust uh, and, and being able to observe how are you feeling, um, what's happening, what's working, as well as what's not working, and maybe we just need to try it differently, right? Um, and so in this, I think there are a couple of, if you want, dangers and opportunities, right? Um, yeah. Danger, I think, is the danger um, to, to miss inclus including the right kind of people and to me is including the biggest amount of people possible right so we i think are privileged uh, to have had education to have tools to have computers internet access if we think about the sdgs we know around the world and also i know from my uh, argentinian background this is still you know for a lot of kids in rural schools something that isn't thought of where school had to stop and they don't know what will happen they don't have laptops to connect to an online classroom right so i think that there's this danger of um missing out on including, uh, which could also mean, you know, larger contrast, larger divides, which is for sure something we don't yeah, want, right? Sure. So exactly, in terms of challenge, it's really, you know, how do we design for inclusion? How do we design to make sure that uh, going online doesn't become a barrier itself, right? The, the format. Mm -hmm. um, then I think is where Stephanie, we have noticed. Stephanie, yes. I, unfortunately, I have to interrupt you because Please. we are really in your no time problem. story no no worries. thank you for your insights i would like to uh, jump to uh, Shin, with my last but not least in this session and also in this uh, symposium with my question for you does the insurance of the virus and all mitigation policies that go with it perhaps teach us something about the word prior covid 19 and if so what how could we use, how could you use the insight when fostering collaboration between different jam teams in Japan? In a certain way, this question connects back to the question from the audience in the session before. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, hello, I'm Shim. Uh, I'm joining from uh, Kyoto, Japan. Uh, okay. Now, 8.30 p.m. here. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I've been organizing the GGJ from uh, first year, 2016. Uh, I started the GGJ Fukuoka that uh, Tokushi already introduced and uh, started with him and uh, organizing for now 50 years. I'm very happy to about it. And actually this topic is related to my experience in the G about GGJ. So I'd like to a little bit uh, share about my experiences with G organizing GGJ. So from 2016, our core uh, concept is inclusivity, I would say. And uh, every time we try to uh, make GGJ more inclusive place that more people can join. And a good example was uh, 2017, the second GGJ in Fukuoka, Japan. Uh, there was a, a very diverse people joining as a participant, also with a design partner. For example, there's a two months uh, 
years old baby and mother joining as designers and uh, participants, users. Also, there's a uh, uh, people with uh, visual disability and the guiding guiding dog, also with uh, wheel users or uh, caring uh, facility facility uh, nurse. So uh, with designers, also Japanese, non-Japanese, uh, English speaker, Japanese speaker. So it's very uh, uh, creative chaos, I would say, and uh, loved it. But uh, for this year, uh, also we try to make it. Uh, inclusive but then now i realized that we uh, set the limitation uh, uh, unconsciously before COVID era so we tried to make it made it uh, inclusive but we could do more actually as stephanie said uh, we had a internet we had a many tools to connect with my house to there like this but uh, we hadn't tried that before and this year we have a chance to try new ways and uh, we carefully choose the tools that uh, there's also digital gap or digital literacy that could be barriers but at the same time that uh, open up more uh, inclusivity i would say uh, there's one example uh, for this year uh, there's one participant who uh, with a disability and uh, she wanted to join uh, ggj and uh, we carefully hear from her and uh, she cannot join. Uh, it's di very difficult for her to join in a physical room because he has, she has to take uh, rest. Uh, she cannot work so long. So uh, caring is important for her, and, but she can join for this workshop and uh, she can use iPad. And uh, we uh, share how to, uh, how to use the uh, slacks or mirrors and zooms already step by step and she learned how to use it and now she get uh, access to that and uh, yesterday actually she sent me the, a message that uh, i'm very very excited to join in the ggj and uh, now i'm ready to move my uh, life forward so she's now very energetic then this story uh, doesn't uh, make me realize that uh, ggj organized ggj more inclusively it, itself is important for SDGs. So this is an actual new value for this uh, new way of GGJ and really excited the, the future GGJ, how we can make this GGJ with a physical way and digital way uh, together uh, to make more and more uh, inclusive workshop. Yeah, that's, that's my point. So it's also finding the new way of caring, I think. Yeah, very, very um, interesting. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Shin. I have here one open question for you, all of you. So how do you ensure that important SDG topics stay on the radar in the times that are dominated by the COVID crisis? Hmm. Hmm. I have to say there's not a formula right so uh, I, imagine <laughs> not. <laughs> I have to say so it, it's a super uh, valid question and uh, what we've seen is everyone goes in risk mitigation mode right for sure yeah. because first things yeah. first we need to keep people healthy uh, and safe and make sure that you know it has the least possible impact on the other hand um, I think as we look into the future, uh, and, and it doesn't need to be the longer term future, right? So the agenda 2030 is pretty close to us. We're just a decade to go. And it's not so much time when we look at the degree of changes that need to be done. So uh, I, I'm really hoping that the pandemic is a reminder um, and that can be used somehow as a model of, you know, if you look at how can countries were collaborating, how international dialogue was happening, how the private sector stepped up, how people as citizens walking on the streets started to comply, started to take care of each other, younger people doing the groceries for the older, right? So there's a lot of solidarity uh, that I think Kelsey was also referring to in the beginning um, that we are seeing and that I hope will just give us that 
push to really dive into the complexity of, of the SDGs because it's certainly not simple topics, they are interrelated, but we need to get started. That's, I think, the message from my side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, so maybe I can just speak from perspective of something that's been happening recently with me. So I, I don't know if anyone in the room has heard of Lady Liberty Hong Kong. Um, have you guys heard of Lady Liberty Hong Kong? No. No. Nope. So basically, um, they're artists, protesters, Hong Kongers. Um, they're amazing. <laughs> they're really cool. And something that they became quite famous and viral for was building a three meter high statue of Lady Liberty and actually bringing it to the top of Lion Rock, which is a, a famous uh, mountain in Hong Kong. And they were doing this to raise awareness and also basically like bring a lot of attention to the Hong Kong protests happening um, this year. And basically uh, they have a, um, a group here in Tokyo as well. And we were talking about what we can do together to maintain the momentum of the Hong Kong freedom fighters and their mission to uh, basically, uh, they have many missions, but in this case, we're focusing on freedom of speech. And, um, you know, I think that in this case of COVID-19, some SDGs are getting forefront, which is great. You know, good health and well-being, incredibly important. Quality education, you know, they say that virtual classrooms have jumped five years in the future almost overnight because of this necessity to teach kids from home. Um, but, you know, what, could, what gets left behind? And in this case for them, they're seeing that their movement uh, it doesn't have as much of attention as they they hope it has because of the the pandemic that's at everybody's front front doorstep, and so we're talking about what we can do and um, you know how we can like maintain that energy and maintain that charisma which which they've been able to demonstrate over and over again. And actually, we're we're going to be holding a hackathon um, online and offline to create products and art installations um, with them. So it can be a kind of like community driven innovation uh, initiative. And um, well, that's what we're doing. <laughs> it doesn't answer the, the gap of all the SDGs combined or, or separately at that matter, but um, basically just the things that you were passionate before just don't stop. <laughs> like, you know, be careful, wear your mask, wash your hands, socially distance, but also continue caring about the things that you always cared about. Yeah, but it goes a little bit also in the direction what Stephanie said before. Not there is not yeah. one form. Now you have to create yeah. your formula. You have to find your context of, and there you will find your formula or your tool. I imagine, yeah. I so totally you, agree. Jean, do you want to add something? Yeah, I think the the always our GGJ uh, thinks the uh, how to say the local context is most important. Uh, and sometimes we lose the local context when we only think about the SDGs. And there's always mm -hmm. local context that connects to the uh, big SDG goal. And mm -hmm. uh, as a, co a coordinator or organizer, always try to find the connection between the local things and people and the big SDGs. So we also this time try to find a very passionate people who are already working on some projects that related to SDGs, some people I uh, think it's not about SDGs, but we see it's about SDGs. So we tr carefully choose these people and ask them, hey, please uh, work together uh, on SDGs. Uh, we call them a uh, project owner. So this year we have six project owners and six teams who collaborate together. So that's that's also a value of the GGJ, that's uh, SDG rated people to SDGs and we can make uh, a space or timing or uh, opportunity or other people can join and work together in a new direction. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, also our importance, I think. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, all of you. If I may add something at the end, I think I uh, found it very interesting what uh, Shin said about this person who could now online participate on an SDG, uh, sorry, not an SDG, on a Global Gold Jam, instead on physically she couldn't. So I think. It's not, maybe it's a reformulation of the question. It's not that the SDGs are not on the radar. Maybe there are other SDGs on the radar than before COVID. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think there won't. Be, I don't think there will be a moment where no ACG is on the radar. Maybe they change which one. Mm. Thank you very much for shading light on this issue and goodbye. Yes, I know it was our pleasure to have you and to have you facilitate uh, have you facilitate the conversations. Uh, it went very quickly, I think. Uh, yes. They were all very lively conversations. Ah, there's Simona. Yes, yes hi. Simona. hi. It, was it was really a full immersion in the different scenes and great. Yes. Thank you. No, th thank you so much. I've been taking so many notes uh, that, yes. you know, I could probably write uh, a book yeah. if, you know, we still write paper book. <laughs> exactly. So um, thank you again for Gabriel for facilitating and thank you again for all the great speakers and for the questions coming from the audience. Um, I just would like to share uh, very simple uh, inputs, for example, from this, the first session, which then, in, in my opinion, reconnects very well to the second and, and the third. So in, in the first session, there was a lot about, you know, what are we advocating for and what are our priorities? So concerning also the SDGs and how is this connected and related um, to the localization and so to the you know context specific challenges that we communities are facing and what are you know what is the the local language which in the case of uh, of india for example it's it's not necessarily a single um country country language so i think the idea of translating and of acting and of action um, is something which has been a common thread through all of the conversations, but particularly in, in, in the first. And how do you think, Nick, that this um, picks up with, uh, with, with, with the second, uh, let's say, conversation? And how does, uh, you know, translation of the SDGs and advocating and priorities connect to uh, our methodologies to implement the SDGs? Yes, thank you, Simona. I also highlighted uh, some things uh, about uh, the second conversation, uh, which I thought was a, a very lively conversation. Uh, thank you again for that, Daniel, Nadim, and Tukul. Uh, the things I highlighted, uh, of course, the, the topic was about the shift from uh, human-centered design to a life-centered design, SDG-centered design. Uh, what are some of the complexities, the pitfalls, and the benefits this shift could bring? Uh, the first thing I took from there, uh, from the conversation of Nadim, was the difficulty of integrating uh, the SDG perspective uh, in the strategy of organizations. What you see, both public and private, is that, uh, yeah, is that uh, things tend to stay remain quite shallow and it's very difficult uh, for people to show their commitment, to make the commitment explicit. Um, so the idea was that maybe it's good to have this integrated more in the strategy itself uh, and the designers can fulfill an important role here. Um, I heard what I like, the designers as the role of rebels in there. Uh, so maybe that could be a way for the future. Uh, another thing I took, uh, what I found really interesting was the discussion about the biosphere uh, and how uh, we should think about the decentering of the human in design. Uh, it's not only the perspective of the human that counts, but the whole ecosystem, the biosphere in which it is inserted. Um, we got some very nice examples there, examples of designs that took you into the body and into the, the microbiology of people and let you understand that people are not just made up of people, but they're also colonies of, uh, of microbes and other organisms that, uh, that make them up. Um, what I liked there was designing for colonies, uh, I took that from that conversation. And the third one, what I really liked, uh, is the, also the practical way of looking at it. Uh, how do you integrate new models uh, and what are their effects on actual, actual practices? Uh, can you name pitfalls? How do you integrate them? Uh, and what is actual the value translation that, uh, that comes from them? Um, the last thing I would uh, like to end with uh, was, uh, was a sentence I picked up uh, to end it on a positive note from Takushu um, that everywhere around the world you will find change makers, you will find people uh, that are willing to, uh, to put energy into, into changing things and to making a better world uh, and we just have to locate these people I think and uh, well that's uh, what the jam is about and that's what we've been trying to do the last five years so uh, I say we, uh, we should continue this, uh, this work in the coming, uh, the coming period. 
Uh, well, thank you. Thank you so much, Nick. I completely uh, agree with you. So I'm just going to, um, again, you know, pick up on uh, some of the concepts which um, uh, stood out to me in the final conversation. And the first is about uh, being literate in the digital space and the concept of scale. Um, both, um, you know, uh, Kelsey uh, and um, I think in the end, actually, all, uh, all of us uh, and the whole team, Stephanie, and also Shin talked about um, you know creating new connections and um, this is very interesting to me particularly when you connected with scale so on the digital side you can really scale up the events and you can scale up um, the impact but on a more intimate level in the physical space the scale becomes very intimate and so you have uh, deep connections between one to one an example was you know super VIP uh, concerts <laughs> um, where you are perhaps the only the only person attending. Uh, this, I think, connects us very well with um, what was said at the beginning, which is let's not forget um, accessibility and the divide that this can actually uh, bring about. So I think that when talking about um, distance and desirability and especially well-being uh, for all, we also have to keep this in mind. And I think it's a, a nice let's say, a uh, concept which brings us back to the beginning or in other way, which brings us back to the futures, which in the end is, you know, exactly what the title of this uh, symposium um, is. Well, Simona, it seems like we have uh, we have reached uh, almost reached the end of the first uh, the first Global Golf seminar. What did you think? Well, I again, I loved it, and uh, I wish these conversations could go on and on for sure. As a local, um, you know, uh, organizer, but also in my everyday practice, uh, I will definitely keep in mind all of the inputs which have been given uh, again by the speakers, which I thank again also for their um, multicultural perspective and also by by the audience. Um, again, everything is connected, um, so I would also have to, um, looking back at understanding, you know, what priorities will we give to, to which of uh, the many suggestions which were brought up today. So definitely uh, a lot to think about and a lot actually to act upon for real impact. Yes, I agree. A lot of input, a lot of new ideas, uh, a lot of people involved. Uh, maybe a nice way to end uh, today before we uh, show a final video of the founder of the, of the event very shortly, is to ask the, uh, the community a last time maybe to post their ideas on how a future, uh, a future symposium could look. If we could do things in a different way or maybe add, some, uh, add something interesting to it, uh, please feel free to, uh, to put that in the chat. Um, as said, we've all reached the end of this, uh, this seminar. I enjoyed it very much. Uh, Simona, thank you very much for uh, for uh, hosting together with me. Thank you, Nick, for making it so you know comfortable. Video, Marco, can you turn it on um, with the founders uh, from the founders of the of the Jam? I cannot believe it's already five years ago that we started with the ID of the Global Goals Jam. And in that year, uh, we reached out to the UNDP and they supported us and we were able to launch the Global Goals Jam during the Social Good Summit. And in that year, already 17 cities in different countries participated with more than 1,000 participants. But this year is going to be bigger. It's going to be different. It's going to be different because we need to do it online. And it's crazy because we need even to show more creativity than what we have ever shown before. The good news is that we have always been online together as a tightly knit community. We know how to find each other online. And what we do best is to focus on problems. And this sounds crazy, but what we do best is to focus on the process in order to understand the problems and not so much on the solutions. Because if you focus only on the solutions from a local perspective, you don't learn at that global scale. So this year, again, we focus on problems. We focus on the process and we focus on each other. Let the Global Goals Jam 2020 begin. Thank you all for joining uh, in this great event. I'm leaving with a lot of energy uh, and good luck the coming days with uh, with the jamming that will place uh, take place online. I'm very curious to see how that uh, 
how that will go in the different locations. Uh, I'm very excited about that. Marco, thank you for uh, arranging everything on this side on the technical. Anna, also, thank you very much. And Simona, uh, again, thank you for hosting this great, uh, great event with me. I'm looking forward to do it again in the future. That